Welcome, and thank you for joining today's conference, Home ARP 101, Non-Congregate Shelter Basics. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. You can submit questions throughout the presentation to everyone from the drop-down menu in the chat panel. Enter your question in the message box provided and send. With that, I'll turn the call over to David Jones. Please go ahead. Thank you so much and welcome again to everyone. I'm glad that uh, you've been able to join us today for the latest uh, Home ARP webinar that we're delivering out. Uh, this one today is going to be on non congregate shelter basics, um, and we're glad that you could join us today. I'm going to, I just wanted to welcome you, and I'm going to go ahead and, and turn off my camera now. We're going to go through uh, the slides. So we're going to have two presenters today. Uh, Jenny Sardone, Director of Affordable Housing Programs, uh, will be speaking today, and I will also be participating throughout the day. Um, we are going to try to, in a broad way today, we're going to try to focus on basic NCS eligible activities. Uh, what PJs need to consider prior to investing Hallmark funds in NCS development, staying in compliance once developed, and further considerations that you need to be looking at if you're considering converting Hallmark NCS projects into permanent housing. Um, it, something that we want to make really clear right now is that it's, it's still very, very early in this process. I mean, the, the time is, is, you know, we have been – Hallmark has been around for a while now, but we still are, are not, don't have uh, NCS projects that are coming through yet. So this is still uh, baby steps for everyone in this process. Uh, we're still fielding lots of questions. We're still open to lots of questions. So we're going to try to give you some information today. And at, at a minimum, we hope that this is going to uh, spur you to reach out to the field offices, reach out to headquarters, reach out to, to Home ARP staff and, and get additional uh, information to help you. So, but we are going to touch on project development, compliance, and conversion today. What we're talking about for non-congregate shelter, and we know that there's non-congregate shelter that is ongoing right now in communities that is not related to Home ARP. But for Home ARP purposes, NCS is defined as one or more buildings that provide private units or rooms for temporary shelter, serve individuals and families that meet one or more of the qualifying populations, and they do not require occupants to sign a lease or an occupancy agreement. So we're going to break down the project development overview into uh, the sections you see here. So qualifying populations, admission and occupancy, eligible activities, eligible costs, replacement reserves, prohibited costs, commitment requirements, and due diligence. like to turn it over for the first part here to Jenny to, uh, to talk about qualifying populations. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, David, and welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. We're really happy um, that you're um, interested in using your home ARP funds for NCS. Um, I just was going to take a few minutes before David really dives into NCS requirements to talk a little bit about the qualifying populations for Home ARP. Um, what we're finding, um, you know, in the allocation plan development process and, um, you know, with respect to PJ's um, home participating jurisdictions that are um, thinking about what projects to fund, um, is that we can never sort of seem to emphasize the qualifying populations too much. So the, the Home ARP statute, that created this one-time funding source um, says that all home ARP funds must be used primarily to benefit these qualifying populations. And in the notice, the CPD 20, uh, 2110, the implementing notice, um, sort of what we state is that all projects have to serve 
these qualifying populations. There's a minor exception in rent, you know, in the rental housing section. But when you're thinking about putting together your um, your allocation plan, or if you're thinking about funding NCS, you really need to think about it in the context of these are the qualifying populations. These are the only people that you'll be serving within a non-congregate shelter that you would fund with home ARP funds. So just to quickly review these definitions, um, there are four qualifying populations. They are established in statute. The first is the homeless definition. Um, that is at 24 CFR 91.5. Um, this is the, in the, these are the COM plan regulations, but these are also the COC regulations, this definition of homeless. Um, but it's really important, um, particularly I think for non-congregate shelter, to be aware of the fact that the, the homeless population in Home ARP is only paragraphs two, excuse me, one, two, and three. Of the, rate of the homeless definition that you're familiar with. Paragraph four is not sort of was removed by Congress. Um, that, is, that paragraph four is the domestic violence definition under homeless. Um, they expanded that definition and they moved that out of the homeless, um, out of the homeless definition for the purposes of this program. So that's really important if you're thinking about establishing preferences in your allocation plan, preferences for non-congregate shelter, when you say, if you say you have a preference for the homeless, you're really talking about um, sort of paragraphs one, two, and three of that definition and not paragraph four, not the DV part of that definition. The second qualifying population is at risk of homelessness. Um, this is exactly the same definition in the COM plan regulations at 91.5 and the definition that's used in the continuum of care program. So no, no changes to be aware of there. Um, and then sort of I mentioned that they took paragraph four out of the homeless definition, Congress, and um, they moved that into, a, into the third qualifying population for home ARP and that is persons who are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, um, or human trafficking. And so, and this definition is also a little bit different than what you're used to dealing with in your programs. Um, what Congress did um, in creating this population is they took the domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking definitions from the Violence Against Women Act regulation that HUD published. So that's 24 CFR 5.2003. But then they also added in um, the human trafficking definition from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act of 2000. So, um, so uh, the domestic violence population, no not in the homeless definition, they are sort of part of their own qualifying population um, so not actually all that confusing. I recommend you go back and look at the uh, look at the notice, um, and sort of you'll see sort of exactly what these definitions entail. The fourth qualifying population was the one population where Congress gave HUD discretion, um, and what those populations are are families requiring services or housing assistance to prevent homelessness or those at greatest risk of housing instability. So that's how Congress sort of um, set that, those, this other population, and then did, did give HUD some um, discretion in terms of how we, how we define that. Can you flip the slide, please? Thank you. So I'm just quickly gonna review those two other populations. These are probably the populations potentially that you're least likely to be serving in non-congregate shelter, but it's certainly worth um, taking a moment. The first possible um, sort of group um, under other populations, other families requiring services or housing assistance to prevent homelessness. So these are households or families who previously qualified as homeless as defined under the COM plan and the, uh, the COC regulation, but they're currently housed due to some kind of temporary um, or emergency housing assistance, 
um, you know, they're getting financial assistance, they're getting temporary rental assistance or some kind of supportive services. So some, there is something that is temp, some assistance that is temporary in nature that has them housed. But the sort of the termination of that assistance um, puts them at risk of returning to homelessness. And so they need some additional housing assistance under home ARP um, or supportive services under home ARP to avoid a return to homelessness. So that's the first part of that other population's definition. David? Thank you. The second part is sort of more along the lines of the, the populations that you're used to in, in programs like the regular home program or the housing trust fund, and that is those at greatest risk of housing instability. And this sort of means either a household that has an annual income um, less than or equal to 30% of area median income and is experiencing severe cost burden. So they're below 30% of AMI, and they're paying more than 50% of their monthly household income toward housing costs. Um, or a household that has an annual family income, excuse me, annual household income less than or equal to 50% of area median income, and they meet one of that long list of definitions in um, paragraph Little Roman 3 of the at risk of homelessness definition. So um, this is an NCS webinar, not a qualifying populations webinar. If you're interested in a deeper dive on the qualifying populations, there's a webinar that we did on qualifying populations, preferences, limitations, and allocation plans back in May of 2022. Um, refer you back to that or to the notice um, to look at these definitions more clearly. But as we move through David's presentation today, please keep in mind um, that these are what the definitions are, these, and these are the only individuals or households that are eligible to be assisted with Walmart funds. I'm going to turn it back over to David. Thanks. Thank you, Jenny. Appreciate it. And that really is, though, I mean, it, you know, Jenny is right in that this is this isn't a QP, you know, presentation. It is NCS. But when we talk about NCS, we talk about admission and occupancy for NCS. That it it must meet the criteria for one of the four QPs. And 100% of Hallmark NCS funds used for acquisition and development must serve the QP. So it, it is crucial that, that the the base from which we start is thinking about those qualifying populations, admission and occupancy. Um, other requirements that might be, you know, different for some of you that are used to dealing with, with just regular home program so that occupants can't be charged occupancy fees or other charges to occupy a uh, home ARP unless this is already a customary uh, fee for some reason or, you know, related to um, the way ESG is being run already. So that's, that's something that has to be, you have to be aware of. We do encourage um, PJs to incorporate uh, home ARP NCS into their uh, coordinated entry system, but this is this is not a, a requirement. But it is certainly something that should be given heavy consideration. Okay, so for uh, NCS occupancy limits, so we're we're going to do a poll question now. Uh, on on some of this, just to kind of get some. Uh, so we pr please participate in this. These these are going to be yes and no questions. So the first scenario that we'd like to give you is uh, a PJ wishes to develop NCS to serve its homeless population with undetermined and unmet needs, and is concerned that the Hallmark NCS is described as temporary shelter, and could require the PJ to move occupants before they are ready for other housing options. So the question we're gonna to pose to you is, does HUD require a PJ to define or limit the length of stay for NCS occupants since NCS is defined as a temporary shelter? Uh, and I believe that there will be a poll question that will pop up here um, momentarily.
Okay. Can, can everyone see the poll question that shows up uh, on the right side of your screen? Everyone could go ahead and, and select uh, an answer, yes or no. Does HUD require a PJ to define or limit the length of stay for NCS occupants since NCS is defined as temporary shelter? Okay, Sharon, if you have the ability to uh, show the results of that now, I think that's probably a, a decent amount of time. Okay. Well, semi, looks like more no's than yeses there, but a pretty um, – Pretty even split. So no, um, HOMARP does not require PJs to establish limits on the length of stay by occupants of HOMARP NCS uh, units. So this is this is um, subject to local and state building codes or ordinances, which may require owners or operators of NCS to do so. So that's a possibility in your locality. And NCS is not intended as permanent housing. Um, as its purpose, or it, it, it is to provide temporary shelter until an individual household can obtain other, you know, transitional or permanent housing. Um, PJs and owner operators of HOMARP NCS may choose to establish limits on an occupant's length of stay. Um, again, this is going to be subject to local and state codes and ordinances and may develop guidelines for operations or just also based around how you're, you're running your, uh, your outreach locally. Um, so the answer is, is no. We, we do not get involved with uh, setting, setting those limits, but again, it, temp it is temporary housing and we anticipate that this is a stop along a, a continuum. Okay, thank you. We can, uh, the, the poll, if you want to remove that poll uh, now, I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, so NCS eligible activities, um, you know, acquisition of structures to be used as NCS, whether you're doing rehabilitation or, or not, or just getting something in standard condition, uh, rehabilitation of existing structures, um, and new construction of structures to be used as NCS are all eligible activities under the program. Um, acquisition of vacant land and demolition of any sort are only permitted as part of a home NCS development. So you can't acquire land uh, to be used at a later date or, you know, land banking, that sort of thing can't be done. And, and no demolition done unless it is done as a part of, uh, you know, further, the further project, right? Okay, so the NCS eligible costs. Um, these should be uh, familiar to any, any uh, folks taking part today that have done home development projects. You know, we are talking about acquisition costs, demolition costs, development hard costs, uh, you know, the sticks and bricks part of the development, site improvements, uh, any related soft costs, and then replacement reserves. Okay, ineligible costs. So, uh, and this is a big one. We're getting a lot of questions on this. Um, but, yes, under Home ARP, uh, they may not be used for operating costs. Um, it's, it has to be for uh, construction uh and, and soft costs related to that, but no operating costs. Uh, rehab and construction costs to turn home or develop NCS units into permanent housing is also not, uh, is not an uh, eligible cost. That is ineligible. So the conversion, while it is permitted, and we're going to get into that later in the presentation, it is not something that uh, is funded with. Okay. 
Um, so we got another another poll question we're going to throw in here for folks. Um, so this is an eligible operating cost scenario that we have for you. So PJ in, invests Hallmark NCS in the acquisition and rehabilitation of a 15-unit motel to be operated as Hallmark NCS. The original activity included minor rehab and replacement of room furnishings, beds, mattresses, cabinetry, seating. So the question we're gonna pose for this poll, can Home Arc funding be used to furnish a Home Arc NCS room? Give you a, a few seconds here, 30 seconds or so, to uh, make a quick yes or no answer. Okay, do we want to show the results? Okay. So the yeses uh, there uh, are, are outnumbering the noes. Okay, so this was um, this was purposely kind of set up as a bit of a trick, okay? So by putting the ineligible cost, um, yes is the correct answer. The cost associated with meeting the minimum Hallmark NCS property standards established uh, in the in the notice, page 60, uh, are eligible if they are a part of a development or rehabilitation budget and are a one-time cost, one-time cost to place the units into service. This may include basic furnishings to create an acceptable individual room to sleep, which includes space and security uh, for themselves and their belongings. So we're talking about basic furnishings, uh, beds, seating, storage, cabinetry, lighting. However, it is an ineligible cost to then replace those items later, right? Or to do, uh, you know, sheets and bedding and, and those sorts of things. That then turns it into an operating cost. So first use of the funding in the development, the furnishing of the rooms is uh, an eligible cost, but that becomes an operating cost if, if it's done later with HOMARP NCS. So hopefully that we've, we've gotten that point across there. Okay, so NCS commitments. Um, HOMARP NCS funds are committed when the PJ executes a legally binding written agreement that meets the requirements in the notice. So the commitment requirements for acquisition NCS can be operated within six months of the date of acquisition. And then we're talking about acquisition there, acquisition only. And the units acquired will not require rehabilitation. If there is rehabilitation and new construction involved, uh, development can begin within 12 months of the commitment date. Okay, so NCS due diligence. So, the project development process, uh, again, should be familiar to those with home experience. We're, we're serving a different qualifying population, um, and we're, we're maybe, you know, tapping into uh, housing resources, you know, motels, hotels, those sorts of things that aren't typical for home at all, right? So that those are where the difference solved. But the NCS process is... Um, NCS process is complicated a bit by the lack of cash flow that is typically created by charging home rent. So the home rents are relatively low compared to market rate in cases, but it's still uh, it's still able to pencil these deals out. This is going to be considerably more difficult in the case of NCS because of the qualifying populations that are being served and the fact that you're not you're not charging. You're not, you're not creating cash flow from this. So before funding NCS, PJs must determine the project is financially feasible. Uh, you need to be looking at information from the owner or the developer that demonstrates the project's financial feasibility throughout the restricted use period, right? That this is going to be a sustainable project and continue to provide that benefit. 
must determine whether the owner intends to continue operating the project as home or NCS or convert to housing after the minimum use period. So you should be thinking about the long-term disposition of whatever you develop, whatever NCS is developed, you need to be looking at long-term disposition. So future conversion of NCS to permanent housing is going to involve a higher level of planning in all stages of development. It's not going to be, you know, and we've had some questions around this. It's not going to be necessary for you to know specific project details of a project, an NCS developed project that you want to convert to permanent housing at some point in the future. But the PJs need to set expectations and think through if and how they will permit conversions. And they need to be talking about this with the developers that are coming along to do it. And they need to be establishing some kind of requirements, even if it's just how to initiate the discussion and the process with the PJ five years down the road. You want to put something in your written agreements and be thinking about it. That's what we're talking about. So you don't have to have specific setup for conversion, but you do need to be thinking about it. And you need to be thinking about what does it look like for us as a PJ and our relationship with anyone that's coming to develop NCS? What are we looking at down the road? This is going to help you not only in the event of conversion, but also just in the long-term sustainability of these assets to your community that are going to provide housing and hopefully continue to provide housing and shelter. So before awarding funds for NCS, PJ must require the developer to submit evidence of appropriate shelter development skills and experience. Owner needs to submit evidence of prior experience in operating shelters, not just developing acquisition or development budget timelines, sources and uses. Again, so if what you're seeing when you're reviewing these documents, if there is a gap in the operating budget, the PJ should require the owner to submit a plan for securing additional private, local, state, federal, whatever other sources out there so that this can continue. This is all a part of every bit of every project you're going to do NCS. I mean, this should be really a part of all the projects you're doing, but it's especially important with NCS and the fact that there just isn't going to be typical cash flow in these deals. Okay. So you have undertaken all the necessary due diligence to commit funds to an NCS project. The next section that we're going to focus on really is getting into maybe some of the property standards requirements, use periods for your NCS project, and requirements for establishing replacement reserves. So you've gotten this far, and we're going to look at just how to make this happen. Okay. So property standards for all projects, home or NCS units and common areas must meet all applicable state and local codes. And HUD's lead safe housing rules at 24 CFR Part 35. Projects must meet home or NCS minimum property standards throughout the restricted use period. So the minimum property standards, for those of you that might be joining us today that have, you know, ESG involvement as well, the standards are included in the notice on page 60, and they really are based on ESG, but with enhancements that sort of the development of home or NCS in consultation with, you know, with the SNAPS folks and with home, just sort of like looking at this as to how do we take this a little bit higher than where it was at. So the key difference that we're going to see is that the requirement for in-unit bath facilities, we're not talking about communal, we're not talking down the hall, we're not talking a toilet in the room and a shower down the hall, we're talking about each individual sleeping room, unit, however you define it locally, is for each person is going to have access to its own bathroom. So for property standards, what we're going to look at for classifications is going to be based on 
whether you're doing an acquisition only project, a rehab project, or new construction. And the key thing to point out here is that these three categories are going to be determined by the PJ's local code requirements and based on the specific work to be performed. So if it's defined as rehab in your local code, it's rehab, right? If it's defined as new construction, it's new construction. And that's gonna vary a little bit from uh, locality to locality. Okay, so in the case of an acquisition only project, must meet HOMARP NCS minimum property standards described in the notice at the time of acquisition and be occupied and operated as NCS without any rehabilitations, no rehabilitation at all. So the example here, and this is something that we're, we, we've seen kind of prior to HOMARP, is you know the acquisition of a uh, resident suite or an extended stay type property in good condition and ready for occupancy, something that they can receive a, you know, a certificate of occupancy uh, based on local codes and regulations and can be occupied straight away without, without anyone doing any work. So that's kind of act, what we're talking about for acquisition only. Okay, so rehab, again, we're meeting all applicable state and local codes, ordinance and requirements. Um, during rehab, we, we do want you to consider remaining useful life of major systems. Um, and if you are develop, if you are going to establish a replacement reserve, uh, to determine remaining useful life of major systems through a capital needs assessment. That's, that's going to be crucial. So any amount of funding committed for rehabilitation makes the project a rehab project, as long as the project is not designated as new construction by local codes. So this, this matters because of the way that we have set up restricted use periods and the time limits for rehab and new construction. I wanna point out here, related to some of the, uh, the needs assessments and thinking, considering replacement reserves. So I wanna make sure that, that everyone is making uh, very clear-eyed decisions on establishing a replacement reserve versus completing the rehab work at the time of acquisition. This is going to require a process locally that is that will be able to do a solid assessment and that will be able to do a capital needs assessment. If you don't have someone there, that you have someone that you trust that can do these. Um, some places aren't doing them, right? So that's that it's important if this is something that you have someone to go to on staff or someone you can hire out, but we wanna make sure that that's being done. Um, if the systems that you're, you know, if roofing or if, if structural systems or HVAC are close to those, those end of life, but maybe they have some years, you might want to make the decision to just go forward with it and, and do that now, complete the work now, especially if you are a PJ that is not familiar with managing replacement reserves or, I mean, I, I know some places that just don't like to deal with replacement reserves at all. And you've got to think about managing that replacement reserve is going to have a longer term administrative involvement from you that maybe the investment on the front end is well worth it versus uh, the hand holding that is going to be required for the replacement reserve. That being said, replacement reserves are an option. Uh, and for those that, that, are, that know how to use them or are eager to use them, that is gonna be an option for NCS. Okay, property standards for new construction. Um, this is, you know, straight away, you know, it's meet all applicable state and local building codes. It's just like any new construction that you're, that you're doing now, no difference. What does it say uh, for local codes? If the distinction really between new construction and rehab, again, I'll stress, is, is determined by local codes and ordinances. But this might be a, a spot if we want to pause, Ginny, if there are any questions that um, that you would that you would like to uh, that we have that we want to we want to do now. Are there any? Um. There are a couple, yeah. We're getting some good questions. Okay. Um, I've, been, I've been so busy calling them out of the chat that I hope I'm not asking any of them too early. Okay, um, well, here, well, do you, if you want, I can, if you, I don't know if you were still pulling some of them together, I can do a, a, I've got a poll question, another one for, on property standards. We want to do that and then 
we'll take some questions from from your side. Sure, that's fine. Okay, great. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw another poll question up. Oops. Okay. Uh, here the scenario we have: the PJ wishes to acquire uh, an unused dormitory for the provision of Hallmark NCS. The dormitory is in good condition and does not require rehab to meet local code. Units are currently configured with four units sharing a common bathroom. The question, can the PJ do this project as acquisition only and begin placing occupants in the building immediately? So again, we'll pop the poll question up. This will be another yes or no uh, poll question. And we'll give you uh, 30 seconds or so to just take a quick, quick take on it. Can the PJ do this project as acquisition only and begin placing occupants in the building immediately? Okay, we can go ahead and show the results. Okay, so a lot of no's, some yeses, but a lot of no's. No, they cannot. Uh, so the minimum home art property standards uh, in the no's require in-unit sanitary facilities that are in proper operating condition are adequate for personal cleanliness and disposable of human waste, and they cannot be communal. So we're talking here in this, this description, everything else is good to go, right? Except that you got four units sharing one common bathroom. And I must point out that the cost of rehabilitating or constructing a building to meet this standard is an eligible home call. So you have the ability with, a, with additional rehab in this project to convert these bathrooms to make it so that they do have individual units. So you shouldn't be discouraged by that. The funding is there to do it and that would be a fully eligible cost. Okay, okay, Jenny, um, I'll, I'll turn it to you for uh, some questions. If you have some questions now that we wanna try. I, we have a lot of questions that are very relevant to what you've just been talking about. Um, a couple of them I think have been answered, but I think it is definitely worth um, asking them again um, with a slightly different twist. So the first question is, can you please discuss exactly what the definition of NCS is? Is this an independent unit with separate bathroom and kitchen facilities? And can there be common areas utilized by other inhabitants of other rooms? So I think okay. you just answered that. Yeah, very good question. So, and, and the making that, having that question when involving baths and kitchens is, is good to know. Kitchens and communal areas are, are okay. Shared communal kitchens or other uh, kitchen facilities are fine for, NC, for home ARP NCS, communal areas. Uh, shared living area is also fine for home ARP NCS. However, we have made the distinction that home ARP NCS is going to be a essentially a self-contained unit, a bedroom, whatever you whatever you want to call it that has access to its own bathroom. So that is that is the key distinction, and that's different from maybe folks that are doing ESG. That's a, that's a major difference. So just to, to boil it down in the simplest of terms, shared kitchens not an issue. Shared bathrooms are ineligible. I think that's the the easiest way to present it. And we have sort of a different twist on this, um, but I think it's worth um, asking or pointing out. Um, someone asks whether there can be shared rooms, in other words, unrelated people um, in the same room. Hmm. Um, I, I think that unrelated people in the same room is, is going to, I, my, 
I, I think where I'm going to go with that is it's going to be based on local codes for that. But Jenny, I, I will, I would throw that to you. So if there's something in there I, that I'm. I actually I sort of, I, I view the question as a little bit different. Um, I think unrelated people who are a household um, can occupy the same room. However, if you're taking two unrelated people who are not sort of a member of the same household and putting them, um, you know, putting, they're not family, they're not a household, and sort of simply making them share a room, the answer to that is no. Right. And, it, and I think it also is complicated by what might be permitted by local ordinance for how they determine unrelated versus related and, and how that is is done in the how in the shelter housing situation. So, but that's a good clarification. And then one last question for you on this topic, okay. David. Um, and it's a good one. Um, is it still acquisition if you replace furnishings or buy furnishings? Oh, okay. So you know, I it's 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 an interesting question there. Um, because I think that that's going to be one that is, is going to require some thought. Because I thought about it in terms, too, um, what a, sort of a difference in, say, uh, rekeying locks, right? Let's say you buy a residence, uh, a residence in, and the thing is move in ready condition, but you rekey all of the locks, you know, is that rehab? And I, and I think that the furnishing questions – you know, it, you know, if you're replacing mattresses, like you, you buy a turnkey facility, but you replace mattresses, is that, um, is, is that considered rehab? I, you know, I'm not, sh I think that might be one that we have to, uh, that we have to throw around unless you, unless you want to throw an answer now, Jenny, um, I, that's, that's definitely one that I thought about in preparing for this and just, you know, I, I don't think that's I don't see that as rehab personally. I don't think that would be review, that would be viewed as rehab based on local you know local ordinance, local code. You're not going to you're not going to have to pull a permit to replace a mattress, right? I mean, so right. I I I I would say um I would say no. Furnishings, changing, rekeying locks, that kind of stuff would not be considered rehab but but we might have to do uh, a little internal discussion on that before uh, answering that question yeah i tend to agree with you um david although sort of for the person who asked that question if you want to follow up with us um sort of um you know we certainly can give you a definitive answer on that and we actually just got one more question david that i want to throw out to you before you move on okay um, because it's something that we get a lot um, and so the question is, if you use home ARP funds for NCS, do you have to, oh, I'm sorry, no, wrong question. If you're developing NCS for families, can a family NCS unit with three bedrooms share a bathroom? And so this is the single family mm. house question. Yes, yes. That comes up so much. Exactly. And, and, and yes, they can. Uh, if, if you are developing um, if you have set up your allocation plan and you've determined that homeless families are something that needs to be served locally, you can uh, do single family housing in which a family uh, unit shares a bathroom. And once they are once they are served in that NCS, that non congress shelter, and move on, um, you ha and you're serving another family in there. That is that is okay. Where this gets where this gets complicated is that it is not the same for three unrelated individuals uh, moving into that house and sharing a bathroom. But if you are serving families and you've set up preferences or limitations and you've established in your locality that that you have a need to serve families, yes, you you can do that in a single family housing situation where uh, a single bathroom. Uh, would would serve that family, and I hope that I hope that got at the question. I think it does. Yeah, I, it it gets. I, I think there's some complexity there. Um, if folks are, uh, if folks would like further discussion on that and want to reach out to us, please feel free to do so. But th that's the distinction that's being made in in uh, sort of 
the idea of non congregate shelter in the desire at the beginning of this to have individual rooms with bathrooms that are serving single people i think that's the way it was talking about and you got to think that a lot of this was being developed at you know when COVID is like full blown and folks are thinking about some of the sort of health aspects of this and keeping folks apart it's it's probably expanded beyond that at this point and if serving families is what you need to do um then there is there is a way to do that where they would have a shared bath um, and actually, we just got a um, we just got a follow up from the person who submitted that question, and she says um, her model includes four or five NCS for families on a single floor, not a single family home. But I think the you know the principle is the same as they can members of the same household or family can share bathrooms, um, you know, sort of as long as they're not sharing them sort of um, outside of the unit. Yeah, I think I, yeah, I, I would agree with that, but I would like, to, I think I would like to see that in more, maybe if that question could be sent with a little more detail um, and we could uh, pick at it a little bit. Because I, I, if I'm heard, if I heard something there, are, are we talking about multiple families on one floor sharing a bathroom or are we, are we talking I'm about assuming, multiple no, people this is... in a family? Multiple, no, I think the question is multiple units essentially on a single floor mm. where there's more than one bedroom in a unit, right? And so there's multiple sort of, there's two bedroom enclosed units that share a bathroom, um, okay. but there maybe are multiple of that on a single floor. Okay. So it's really the same, right? Okay. 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 Thanks, David. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. We're going to, um, we're going to move on now. Okay, so ongoing property standards and inspections. So uh, PJs must develop ongoing inspection procedures um, requiring an annual, annual inspection. And we can take the, uh, the poll question down too now. We don't need that. Um, the uh, require annual inspections, perform uh, follow-up inspections to verify any deficiencies are corrected within six months. And ensure properties meet the NCS property standards, the minimum property standards throughout the restricted use period, and life-threatening deficiencies must be corrected immediately, and PJ reinspects to verify within 14 days. That's pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so we've talked about restricted use periods throughout this, and I want to – for those of you that have gotten into the notice and looked at some of this, the, the restricted use period is not the minimum use period. There are two separate components here. Um, a minimum use period is the amount of time that the NCS property must operate as emergency shelter before they can be converted to permanent housing. The restricted use period uh, is, is looking at, so, the NCS may remain as a homework NCS as originally developed during the restricted use period. It can be used as NCS under the Emergency Solutions Grant Program. Uh, it can be converted to permanent affordable housing after the minimum use period, or it can be converted to uh, COC permanent housing after the minimum use period. So the minimum use period is going to dictate how long it operates as emergency shelter before doing any of the other things that are permitted under HOMAR. Okay. PJs must comply with the requirements of the notice for not less than the restricted use period. They must impose HOMAR NCS requirements through a deed restriction. Again, this should be familiar to home folks. And the duration of the restricted use period is based on the activity type. And remember how we talked about new construction, rehabilitation, or acquisition only. And those are, here are the time frames for that. So if you are doing new construction, there is a 15 year restricted use period. We, we, uh, that's what we, we wanna make sure that we're getting 15 years of use uh, for any new construction project. Uh, rehabilitation is dropped to 10, and then acquisition only is dropped to 10. And that's, that is the restricted use period. 
Okay, so let's look at this as through the different, you know, the different scope of, of, of what's happening. So if the project is going to remain as non-concrete shelter, what does that mean? That means that it, there is no change in use during the restricted use period. So whether you did a rehab and it's 10 years or you did new construction in 15 years, whatever that original written agreement said is what it's going to be for the entire period. Uh, it just, it, that's it. And you're serving the same population, no changes. You, you decided that it's gonna be NCS and that's what it is for the entire period. After the 10 year period or the 15 year period, then you're free to make choices. You, 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 it, it, it turns into whatever it is, then you don't have uh, HUD involvement. Okay, so restrict use period. So if you are using it as ESG, um, and this is something that's, that, you know, we're talking about, you are permitted uh, to basically use HOMARP uh, NCS funding uh, to construct a building, and if it's possible for you to align this with a uh, ESG project, it can immediately become an ESG uh, project. So the ESG funds can be provided for operating and essential services. So this is, you know, during the development of this, we've looked at this and saying this is uh, sort of trying to bookend this, right? So we've, we've, we're bringing the funding from Home Art to create units that, could transition and be accepted and, and work with ESG to be able to help with operating and essential services. If that is the case, it has to be operated in compliance with ESG, with 24 CFR Part 576, and all applicable ESG requirements govern in the event of conflict with Home ARP. So you're essentially uh, using Home ARP to develop and you're using ESG to operate and provide services. That is that is something that has been intended and we encourage you to explore all options to make that happen. Okay, replacement reserves. So we talked a little bit about this before. Um, Hallmark funds can't capitalize a replacement reserve uh, to pay reasonable necessary costs of, of replacing major systems. Uh, we need you to do a CNA, and, and major systems are listed here, um, roofing, cladding, plumbing, you know, that, that's, that's what we're talking about. Um, again, I have, to, I have to point this out. This is good. Establishment and use of the replacement reserve has to be incorporated into the written agreement and PJ should determine their role in how disbursements from the replacement reserve will be managed and what level involvement the PJ will place in the process. Know what you're going to do with this ahead of time. If it's not something that you're familiar with in your locality, plan it out, make sure that you're okay with it. I, I have past history with PJs that I have, have worked for that, you know, the the attorneys didn't did not want us doing replacement reserves or getting involved in that at all. So just know that this is something that you can do locally before you decide. Um, if the useful life projection projection that you've done in your your CNA is close to the end, uh, you know the restricted use periods, PJs need to seriously consider incorporating the work into the original project. The replacement reserve is there; it does involve additional work, but you just think about the process before you get into it. It's it's more it's more involved uh, if it's not something that you've done before. Okay, so returning of the replacement reserve. So, um, if the NCS project continues as NCS, the projects can retain any replacement reserve that they set up to pay reasonable and necessary costs. That's that's available to them. If the NCS project will not continue as NCS, the remaining funds in the replacement reserve must be returned to the PJ's home treasury account. If HOMARP grant has expired or closed out, the remaining funds in the replacement reserve must be deposited in the PJ's local home account. They have to be recorded as program income received in IDIS, and then you could use them for eligible costs under 24 CFR Part 92. We're, you know, we're, we're pointing this out now. It's, it's important information, but it's also, you know, it's probably something that most of you, if you get involved with this, we're, we're talking years off. So come back to us and let's talk about it if you start needing to make these decisions and uh, thinking about these processes, right? Okay, so 
what is uh, what is project completion as it relates to HomeWorp NCS and why is it important? So project completion starts the clock on the use period. So what do we mean by project completion? It means all necessary title transfer requirements of construction work have been performed. The project complies with the requirements of, of the notice, uh, property standards, uh, final inspection have been done. The project is actively operating as HomeWorp NCS. Final drawdown has been dispersed and project completion information is entered into IDIS. So that's that's when your restricted use periods and minimum use periods start. Okay, conversion to permanent housing. Um, getting a lot on this. You know, we've gotten a lot of questions on this and I think there's a fair amount of confusion. There's a lot of the questions that come through um, are making an assumption, I think, that and sort of equating conversion with adaptive reuse. And that's not really what we're talking about as it's related to home ARP. Under home ARP, conversion means a change in the original use of the home ARP NCS. So how it's operated. It doesn't necessarily have to be a physical construction related process. Um, conversion while permitted, conversion of home ARP NCS to permanent housing is not an eligible activity type and the costs related to turning uh, home ARP NCS into permanent housing are only eligible under the rental housing at existing NCS into permanent housing are only eligible under rental housing activity. So when, and there could be folks on the, on the call today that have even posed the questions, let's say that you have a operating non-congregate shelter uh, in your community right now that you're looking at saying, I, you know, we want to we want to rehab it. We're going to keep doing it as NCS. That is not a conversion. That would just come in as a home ARP rehab. If you are looking to change um, and and do something different with something that's operating as NCS into permanent housing, then that would be a rental housing project, right? That would not be home because it is currently uh, an NCS project. That does not necessarily make it. An NC, a home ARP NCS project. If you have any any questions, I mean, we could we could kind of dig into that deeper here. But on count of time, I would say reach out to us and we can talk about the specifics around that. Okay, so conversion requirements. Um, so the what the permitted conversions for us is really looking at conversion to permanent affordable housing, which is is home ARP rental housing is what we're thinking about there when we say permanent affordable housing or conversion to COC permanent housing. So if we're talking about permanent affordable housing, NCS is converted to permanent affordable housing in accordance with the rental section of the notice and only after a minimum use period as non-concrete shelter because that's what we're, we, this was set up and developed originally to be non-congregate shelter. You're permitted to do conversions to something else later, but we want to we want to see that it operates and serves those qualifying populations as as described for a certain amount of time. Um, but it can serve it, it may serve different populations from the original uh, the original QPs if it after that minimum use period. If you're converting to COC permanent housing, uh, it's converted to permanent housing under McKinney-Vento um, according to the requirements of the notice and of 24 CFR Part 578. Again, only after a minimum use period as NCS, and then it must serve eligible COC populations. Again, must stress no additional home ARP funding for the conversion. So you're doing this, you're doing this from other other resources, conversions to other uses are using other sources of funding. Okay, minimum use period. So if it's acquisition only, it has to operate as NCS for a minimum of three years. If it is a moderate rehab, five years minimum use period if the total investment is less than 75% of the appraised value. Substantial rehab would be considered 10 years if the total investment is more than 75%. If it's new construction, 
it's 10 years. So these are minimum use periods that it would be operated as non-congregate shelter prior to any, uh, any conversion to any other use. Okay. Uh, restricted use period, converted housing. And it must continue to comply with the requirements of the notice through the end of the restricted use period for the project, and it must fulfill the balance of the home ARP NCS restricted use period. So um, conversions do not necessarily wipe out being able to uh, serve the folks that we intended to serve. It's just that it's, 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 a, it's a process of, of being able to convert it and, and moving towards more permanent housing based on your, on your needs locally. Okay, permanent affordable housing. It must not invest additional ARP funds to convert. It's not paying for any operating. Uh, it must determine that there's adequate financial resources are committed to the project to meet property standards of the notice. Uh, it must maintain the financial feasibility of the project to be operated as permanent affordable housing for the qualifying populations and develop and evaluate the project in accordance with standardized underwriting guidelines conversion. And I do believe, I don't have details to share with you today, but I do think that there will be additional uh, webinars, TA products, uh, some level of additional guidance that is going to, um, to touch on this underwriting guidelines um, as we move forward and, and we start to see projects materialize. Uh, we're going to provide that background. Okay, permanent affordable housing. So um, the PJs have to amend the use restrictions for home ARP NCS to reflect the conversion to permanent affordable housing. You're changing the NCS to uh, different housing types. So that's going to change the, the overall dynamics of the project and there's gonna have to be new restrictions put in place to sort of lay out what it is. So plan for that uh, and, and know that that needs to happen. So the provisions for imposing affordability requirements uh, at 24 CFR 92.252 E1 through E4 apply to the amended use restrictions. And the amended use restriction for the permanent affordable housing must be enforceable to maintain compliance with the requirements of the home ARP notice. Okay, so we've got a, a, another poll question. So the scenario we have here is the PJ has an opportunity to acquire a building that could accommodate the development of NCS and an affordable multifamily rental project on the same site or, or in the same building, but two different uses. So can the PJ provide home ARP funds for the development of the project with both NCS and permanent affordable rental housing mixed in the same project? And again, this is a, a yes or no yes or no answer uh, and pop the poll question up here and please uh, make a selection and then we'll talk about it. Okay, and show the results if you would please. Okay. Okay, so more yeses than no, and that is correct. Yes, PJs can use home ARP funds on a project with a mix of unit designations. However, if a PJ intends to fund a development that contains both home ARP NCS and home ARP rental units, the PJ must set the property up in IDIS as two separate activities and conduct cost allocation in accordance with 24 CFR 92205D1 uh, to ensure that the cost of the two activities are separately identified, tracked, and documented. 
both the home ARP NCS and affordable rent units must meet the requirements in the home ARP notice. The written agreement must clearly identify and describe the project. And additional guidance is being developed on conducting cost allocation for home ARP NCS units when combined with other home ARP sources of funding. But it is permitted. It's just more complicated. And there's a few extra steps to it. But we appreciate and welcome creative uses of the funding. Okay, so COC permanent housing. Non-concrete shelter, home ARP non-concrete shelter can be converted to COC permanent housing to serve the following eligible households. During the restricted use period, but after the minimum use period, PJs can permit the conversion. And they must be done according to the written agreement with the owner of the home ARP NCS. So, again, this is an opportunity to take NCS and sort of bookend it with COC in that way. It just needs to be thought through. It needs to be laid out in the written agreement. And it is more involved. But it is an opportunity that we hope PJs will be looking into and coordinating with the COC on. Okay, so like we said, we are encouraging this. We hope that you're pursuing partnerships and leveraging opportunities with the COC early. And that they've been a part of this process from the beginning. That this is an ongoing discussion. Also, it's important to note that home ARP supportive services, TBRA, is available to qualifying households who might need to move as a result of any conversion. So, making sure, again, we're just pointing out that there are resources there to make these things happen and to explore them. And if you have questions about them, you can reach out to the field offices and reach out. They can reach out to us and we can talk through various scenarios. So, we're getting somewhat close here. I think the last bit that I have really is just the resources page. And then I think I'll see if Jenny has any questions. This presentation webinar will be available, I'm not sure, but probably within a week or two. And then this resources page has the links. But just going through HUD Exchange and HUD.gov, there are a lot of resources there. And they're shown here, but then the links will be available to you when this is sent out. And with that, I would see if Jenny has questions that she would like to ask. We still have five minutes or so, it looks like. So, we could definitely take some questions. Yeah, we have a lot of great questions. I'm really impressed by sort of the great questions that have been submitted. But before we sort of dig into some of those, because there's a lot of them. There were so many good questions. It was hard for me to cut any out. So, I've tried to answer some of your questions individually in the chat. So, if you posted a question, particularly if you posted it to me privately, please take a look before the webinar ends to see if I answered it for you. And will those transcripts be available as well with what gets sent out? Generally, not the chat. But one thing that is not on this slide and that I want to be clear, because a couple of times I've said and several times David has said, sort of send that in to us or get in contact with us. And so, if you have just general questions you haven't asked here, or sort of you've asked a question in the chat and we're not going to have an opportunity to address it, because a few of these are very sort of fact specific and probably not something we can do on this webinar. Sort of please, and I'll put this into the chat, please send your questions to homearf at hud.gov. That is a mailbox that our staff in the Office of Affordable Housing Programs staffs. And 
sort of will answer your questions or, you know, sort of reach back out to you um, if we need more information. So if you have specific questions about a project you're trying to do or um, just something that you need to understand better, um, homeart at hud.gov is the place to get those answers. Um, also, there's your field office, um, and there's um, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of materials as David has put here on this slide um, that we've posted with more coming all the time. Um, but please, um, you know, if you have questions, that's okay. So David, I am going to. Um, there's a, I probably have at least 10 questions here, so I'm see if we can do relatively short answers to these, but they're all so good I wanted to handle them. Okay. Um, so we have somebody asking if we can talk a little bit about the developer requirement um, for having experience developing shelter space, and specifically they ask whether experience developing affordable permanent housing is an acceptable substitute for the development experience for NCS. I think that Again, these are going to be local decisions, right? I think that what we're trying to point out, and, and maybe this is maybe this is us as home folks uh, overcompensating for just how completely new Home Arp NCS is, and the idea that folks are potentially going to go out and purchase, um, you know hotels, motels, other other structures that aren't typically done in home. And it might be us sort of saying, look, this this is different, right? And and maybe it won't be different in a year or two. Maybe it'll seem more familiar to us. Maybe in your locality right now, there is no difference in the developers that are that are converting and doing uh, motels into non congregate shelter that you've already done uh, from from those that are doing you know regular home multifamily or other stuff I you know I, I we think that it is special and different enough that this is a specialized uh, process maybe it's not in your locality so I don't know I mean you know, the notice doesn't go into specific details other than some of, you know, what I briefly stated today. And you can look, you know, getting a little more detail uh, in the notice about that. So potentially, uh, potentially this doesn't look much different, but I, I think that we need, we, we all need to think about this. This is different. This is different for us, I think. Okay. So we have a couple of questions that um, I'm going to try and wrap into a single question about sort of whether you sort of um, the role of the COC um, in NCS development and whether you must partner with the COC. And so I think, you know, particularly for non-congregate shelter, um, you know, it makes sort of a lot of sense to be partnering with the COC because um, sort of where, sort of what is going to be the source of referrals for your non congregate shelter. But the, um, somebody is, you know, one exception to that possibly might be if you're going to do a shelter that is only for the domestic violence, um, dating violence, trafficking um, sort of population. Um, and you may be using a different, if, it, if it's a shelter limited to that population, you might be using a different source of referrals. Um, right. Somebody is pointing out that this, and this is really important, that the, C, the CE, the coordinated entry system used by COCs don't really match with the four, the definitions of the four qualifying populations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that is absolutely true. Right. Um, and so the person is saying it doesn't really seem feasible to use the coordinated entry system. So I'm going to sort of, I'm going to recommend for anyone who has questions around that, um, that you go to the notice. Um, you know, it is, you know, it is quite clear sort of that there is a, there is a, like a not, not a complete um, sort of match between home ARP and what CE does. And so the Home ARP Notice, CPD 2110, has sort of goes over the three different options that you have for referrals um, involving CE or not involving CE. Um, and also that I posted the link to the, the webinar that I talked about for where we go over the qualifying populations. Um, and I'm gonna post it one more time before we, um, before we drop off. 
the May webinar that I was talking about, that webinar we talk about sort of the different options for um, taking referrals, um, using the CE. And so if you've not seen that webinar, um, I really recommend that you go back and watch it. It is on the HUD Exchange. Um, let's see. And a few a few additional points to this too. There is there is a uh, Hallmark guide to ESG for PJs that is um, available now, and there is a webinar that is going to specifically deal with um, Hallmark and coordinated entry and and how that can work. But it's it in as much as is reinforcing what Jenny said that there is a benefit to to being involved with the COC. Um, it is not a requirement, but we certainly believe that it would be a benefit. And it's okay. and it's in in using coordinated entry is also not a requirement, but there are ways that it will benefit both of those factions in your local jurisdiction, right? And we we know that they operate um, sometimes in their own in their own places, home, and they don't they don't really come together as much, but. We are hoping that Home ARP NCS funding is going to help that to kind of come together and that you're going to think through some of those things. But it's, it is tough. And, and like I said, we will have, um, we're going to have additional, um, additional TA coming out. And this is all going to be within the next, these things are done. We're just kind of getting things queued up um, to be able to be delivered. So you're, you're probably within a month going to see um, some of these additional webinars coming out where we're going to touch on this specifically around how home ARP and coordinated entry works, how referrals are going to be able to uh, happen. Um, and we're not going to be able to, to make it perfect. We're not going to be able to, you know, have, have those things align exactly, but there are options available that will, I think, be there will be more positives uh, available to folks on, on both sides. Thank you, David. I think actually we're a little bit over time. Okay. Um, so um, I'm gonna add, sort of pass it back to you to wrap up, but before I do, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who, um, who participated today. I wanna reiterate that sort of these slides and this presentation will be posted. So. Um, that may take a week or two, but sort of definitely will be available. And um, also, once again, please, if we didn't get to your question, send it to us and we will answer you individually. Go ahead. Thank you very much, everyone. David? Yes, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate the questions. Um, use, the, use the Home Art mailbox. Use your resources at the field office. Um, they will they will get questions to us if they are are not able to handle it and keep the conversation going. Be thinking about this. We're again, um, we don't have uh, projects yet, right? There isn't home ARP NCS uh, happening yet. Uh, we are encouraging it. Get your allocation plans uh, in. If home ARP NCS is something that uh, you are interested in. Let's talk about it and and let's uh, let's get rolling with it. And it's an opportunity. This is a, a really great opportunity for everyone on this call to access funding to do things that they probably have been telling someone in their locality they wanted to do. Um, we're we're we've got the funding to help with that. So thanks everyone. Uh, take care. And I will I will turn it over to. Uh, Sharon, I guess, to just close it out. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.